Frank Flood came home in the autumn, came home from the horrors of war. To a widowed mother and a farm in disrepair, he bent his back to labor, and he sought his fortune there. On those fields his father had cleared in the shadow of Mount Hersey. By the time the winter came, he had a wife. Before it came again, he had a son. And that house filled up with laughter, and those paper thin cries. While the fields are filled with produce, and the pastures filled with life, all the memories of the war began to fade in the shadow Shut of Mount Percy. But the child grew ill And in two years died And they laid him to rest On the mountainside A little coffin by his grandfather's grave In the shadow, shadow of Mount Hersey So again, Frank bent his back to labor and he built, and he tilled, and he plowed. I'm joined today by Aaron Smith and Still on the Hill. They are here to talk about the legend of Sam Davis and other stories of Newton County, Arkansas. The album and the book by Aaron Smith and the Coal Biters features Still on the Hill, Aaron's daughter Gray, and a whole lot of other musicians, artists, places, and characters. Alongside the, the songs is a book of photos, hand-painted maps, and a colorful abstract paper cutouts inspired by the album's 14 songs. Thank you all for joining me today. Happy to be here. We're Absolutely, honored. yeah. <laughs> I'm honored to have the three of you. Um, when Aaron sent me the email and said, still on the hill or coming with me, I was like, <laughs> I, my jaw about hit the oh. ground. <laughs> 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 um, uh, for oh. my listeners who, don't know, who are unfamiliar with Kelly and Donna Mulholland, um, they are the ambassadors of the Ozarks who've been documenting the stories of the Ozarks and its people, quote unquote, for decades. Um, Kelly and Donna, um, do you feel like you're sort of passing on the torch here with this project? I think unquestionably there, there's a tie. And, you know, it, wouldn't, it wasn't intentional, but, uh, but, it, but we, we could not be more thrilled to see what Aaron did. Mm -hmm. You know, we had been doing the, the, you know, researching stories from the Ozarks, turning them into songs, and uh, we met Aaron, and he saw us doing that. I, I suppose it, it had something to do with it, but uh, he really took took it and ran with it and uh, and created a, a, a body of work that is so substantial and so beautiful and, and we're so proud to be his friend and be a part of it. I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. <laughs> if we are passing on the torch, that's a dream come true. Mm. Yeah, well, I hope you're, neither one of you are planning to stop because... <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not. <laughs> no, just not touring as hard coast to coast, but <laughs> more regional so we can be with our family and friends and, mm -hmm. and everyone here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Aaron. Yeah. Of course. Aaron, how did you get to know Kelly and Donna? Um, the, I think the first time... Well, the first time I ever saw Kelly and Donna perform was on the Harrison Square like 25 or 30 years ago. And... Mm -hmm. um, I watched him for a little while, and and I thought that skinny guy can really play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and I was watching Donna dance, and they were with their five piece band, and and so I definitely noticed them. And uh, and I think as a student at the university, I saw I saw you guys around campus from time to time. Um, yep. So, but the next time I saw them was really when I, I became aware of what they were doing with stories and Ozark uh, stories in particular, and that was at the Hotel Seville in Harrison. And they played a uh, an unamplified show uh, in a room there, and uh, and I had never it, I had been I had done a lot of music that was heavily amplified, mm -hmm. and I had just gotten really sick of the volume level of the like uh, artifice, like the fake fakeness of it, and that there's no, I don't mean to criticize that music. It was just I became really tired of it. Um, it's great for people to enjoy that. If you're enjoying it, then great. It <laughs> works for anything that works for you. Go do it. But I, uh, there was something so human about the way that they were sharing music, 
on the same floor that we, the rest of us, were on, uh, without the, all the amplification in between us, without like a lot of echo or reverb drenching everything, making it sound <laughs> unnatural, you know. And uh, and they were telling stories of people that that were like the people that I was meeting in my day to day life. So, and I had a, a job that put me in contact with a lot of older folks, and I just felt like. Uh, it was authentic in a way, in several ways, that I just not seen music being done. And, uh, and so that was the first. And then they came and played a show at my house mm -hmm. um, in Harrison. And I uh, started to go to their Waddle Hollow creativity retreat that they have with Jack Williams. And, uh, and just started to feel like, well, I've got, you know, I've got until the spring to write a song, or I've got until the fall to write some songs to share at this thing. And that really gave me a... Uh, you know, it gave me a community to start writing towards and writing for. There are other other communities, some in Harrison too, that I was engaged with. But that Water Hollow uh, family was was huge for me, huge. So that's kind of our, our journey. And we've uh, yeah. there was a point where I realized that we'd actually become friends. Like they think of me as a friend also, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's yeah. been a very very sweet friendship. We, we have some common ground, especially Aaron and myself. You know, I, one thing is we. Strangely enough, m most people might not realize that we both have a, a very deep love for classical music. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very much part of what we do, even though it might not be obvious to everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we both studied music uh, in, in that way. And, and even, the, you know, so I, I found ways to integrate that, that toolbox into what Donna and I do. And he's figured out how to to make it work as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And those, uh, we've dialogued a lot about it. And, yes. And also about just how to record an album. I, I built right. my home studio based at first around the same equipment that Kelly had because it was inexpensive and worked for him. And like, yep. and we've kind of, we've gone back and forth on a now lot of Now he's got really a, and, nice stuff and I still got the same old junk. <laughs> we've got a few nice things too that we've like, <laughs> yeah, we've right. kind of gotten together, yeah. <laughs> and so, but Kelly's been a mentor as far as how to produce an album on the cheap and my yeah. first album, he came over, I'd gotten to the point, I call it like uh, auditory anorexia where I kind of <laughs> listened to it and I couldn't hear anything good. <laughs> and when he, he came over and, and helped me uh, clean it up and finish it and uh, watching him enjoy it kind of helped me like have the courage to actually release it. <laughs> I was at the point where I was starting to feel like no one can ever hear this. <laughs> um, but uh, Kelly really helped me over that hurdle with that first album. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I, I've, I've, I relate to that so much. Um, my, my editors, Becca Martin Brown and April Wallace can attest to that one. Mm -hmm. I've had, yeah, sure. you know, you have to, you, you really do need someone to come and pull you out of the weeds sometimes. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. Um, so uh, did you learn how to collect these folk tales, these or stories from people from Donna and Kelly, or um, was that something that happened organically as you were walking around? I mean, tell me how that came yeah. about. Um, I've, I've been really interested in narrative before I met Donna and Kelly. Yeah. Um, and part of that... Um, it was just I. It was part of my church background, really. I uh, I remember there's this thing where Jesus tell, tells a parable, mm -hmm. and some of those don't make a lot of sense. Um, and it was just interesting to me that that choice to to tell a story to make a point, and sometimes the point's not obvious. Sometimes the point's confusing or mysterious in what he had to say in those. And and. Uh, and I just got really interested in the power of a story to engage the mind in a different way, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, like, had had done some reading about meta narratives and how our worldviews are built out of these big stories that we tell. And if you want to, if you want to change people's minds about something, then that's the place to engage. Because if we engage on particular issues, then we, we meet people's defenses right away because what they're actually doing, they might not even care that much about those particular issues, but they're protecting a meta narrative that's that's sacred, you know? Right. So it's kind of a nerdy answer. <laughs> but <laughs> but <That's okay. laughs> one thing that really struck me when I uh, heard, you know, Kelly and Donna's music, one one thing that really struck me, because you know, environmentalism is so important to them, and they and they go into these communities where that's definitely not the the top priority. Mm -hmm. But but we're connecting around this love of place mm -hmm. and these people that are in it. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which I just, I looked at it and I thought, I think that this is actually a really great way to 
pull people along to that goal, that love of place, mm -hmm. this place that we all live, that we have to value to survive, um, I think they're going to have a lot of success with what they're doing because they're engaging that. And it, it kind of excited me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I also really liked that they were, there were a lot of stories about older people. Mm -hmm. And I think the tendency to forget older people or to forget our, even our recent history, a lot of people can't name their great grandparents, mm -hmm. you know, um, is really tragic. And that, that uh, uh, it's something we're really losing that we shouldn't lose. We, should, we don't have to lose that. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. I like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. All right. That's well, really cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, something that you had said in an interview with KUAF is that you love unreliable narrators. I do, yeah. <laughs> um, um, they are fun. So um, I'm wondering what your litmus test is for spotting an exaggerator. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is one. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's absolutely everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are human beings. We are all like we take in data, we make it into something new, you know. And like even you know how you, people in your own family have different versions of the same story. Yes. And we we are always doing that. We're always building that meta narrative. <laughs> my my brother is a jerk. You know, like <laughs> you're building that story, or you're you know tearing it down. Or, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it's all of us. I mean, it shocks, it was kind of a really interesting thing when you, Aaron wrote five songs about Sam Davis. Right. And at the same time, Kelly and I were writing one song about <laughs> Sam Davis. He wrote, his is epic, it just all weaves together. And it's kind of interesting because our story has a lot of different facts than his story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the same sort of thing. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we saw it from a very different angle. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, some things were the same, but there was, you know, driftings. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we're not academic historians. We're we're, <laughs> we're storytellers, and yeah. it's so it's it's, yeah. it's it's part of the storytelling process to mm -hmm. you know, to improvise and mm -hmm. embellish. 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 <laughs> yeah. So. I love that element, though, when you realize that the person that's been telling you the whole story can't be trusted <laughs> and there are, there are two songs in particular on this album mm -hmm. one is Ab Claiborne and the other is The Snow Child mm -hmm. where it's different people are going to feel differently about it um, but those songs in particular I wouldn't trust those narr narrators <laughs> at all like I think that they're obvious lies and um, and uh, and a lot of other people do too so. yeah. <laughs> you gotta start somewhere I think it's it's a, it's when you're asked about why the narrator's lying to you, why would they say what they have to say, there's a layer of meaning in that, too, that's really deepens the story, too. Yeah. 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 And it's still a good story. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of those, let's talk about the Martin family. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly, I, I know you listed them in the intro to the book. Have you have you all written about the Martin family, we have too? Not. Okay. No, mm -hmm. uh, Sam Davis is the only, actually, thing we double up on. Everything mm -hmm. else was mm -hmm. not, okay. not so. All right. All right, so tell me about the Martin family, a little bit mm -hmm. more about them. Yeah, um, well, Norman R. Martin was a, a, uh, he was a Church of Christ preacher, and he wrote down the story of his family, mostly for his family. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a lot of books, um, but the one that I treasure, and it's really on a different level of quality than the others, uh, is called Up on the Buffalo. And the first few chapters of that... Um, are about the immigration of Henry Henry Martin or Martin at the time uh, to uh, from France to the Blue Ridge Mountains of, of Georgia, and marrying into a Cherokee fam uh, Cherokee tribe, um, raising a family, building a farm, and then the entire tribe gets evicted onto mm -hmm. the Trail of Tears, and uh, and Henry decides to take his family with him and and with the tribe rather than stay and live. As white people, which historically I checked this because because uh, uh, Norman Martin is an unreliable narrator, <laughs> and he yeah. and I've read a few books where he told different versions of this story, and in some versions of the story he'll say that they couldn't have stayed, and some he'll say that only Henry could have stayed, but the family had to leave. Um, but legally, the legally the whole family could have stayed, mm -hmm. and I think I think I was really interested to read that and and realized that Henry really identified with the tribe over uh, the white people in the area, and that he would rather keep his family around those type of people. Uh, mm -hmm. It was kind of meaningful to me to see that. Um, but they wound up on the Trail of Tears, and that, uh, 
that gets us through the first song, the fr first mm -hmm. Martin family song. Um, on the Trail of Tears, one of his daughters fell in love with a, a soldier, a federal soldier, and he helped them escape around Russellville. Mm -hmm. And it had become very dangerous. They were, they were burying people constantly on the Trail of Tears, and uh, Henry was afraid that if they stayed, um, then that, that they might die too and didn't trust where they were being taken, didn't trust what might happen. And so they escaped with the help of this soldier who had fallen in love with his daughter and the soldier came with them. They stole two horses, so they were, you know, felons or, or you know, right, they were yeah. in real trouble for what they'd done. Because they shot horse thieves. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And uh, I, I just thought it was really beautiful, that story, that this young man made a choice to leave everything, to become a deserter, to be, to join this family. Because he wasn't just getting the girl. Mm -hmm. Like, he's leaving everything to be a part of this, you mm -hmm. know, outlaw band of, you know, half Indian and a French guy, and they're going to go where? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, he, uh, yeah, it's quite a sacrifice. And so, mm -hmm. to me, it was a really beautiful love story, which is the second song of that, mm -hmm. uh, that series. And then... Uh, the third song of that series is uh, Curly and Tom. And uh, Henry had a son, Albert, who married a woman from, the, the, the family made their way up to Whitaker Point, mm -hmm. uh, Hawksbill Crag, and, and lived around that area. And uh, eventually, Henry's son, Albert, got married to a woman who, from that area. And uh, they, uh, they had a family, had a couple boys who were troublemakers and um, the last song in that series is about those two boys and how they, how their choices made Albert and Debbie have to leave Newton County forever. And, uh, and it's a, it's a pretty grisly story. It ends with a murder mm -hmm. at uh, Valines General Store, which you can, a lot of people have been there to see the elk and Valines General Store is right there on the road. And, and uh, yeah, there's a pretty grisly scene where someone's <laughs> killed mm -hmm. there at the store. Um, <laughs> And so I loved, there are so many things about the Martin family story that I loved. Um, I just, there's so much tension and there's so much American history built into it. And I loved the, in the uh, Curly and Tom story, just I'm a parent and um, I'm a parent of teens. <laughs> and I'm also an observer of other parents <laughs> with teens and, and just have watched how like, this is a wild thing that we've kind of gotten ourselves into that we don't have control over. And there are a lot of people selling books that will tell you how you can have control over this thing. And, <laughs> yeah. and I think Debbie was, Debbie Martin was the kind of parent who buys those books and employs all those three-step plans for how to, how to, you know, deal with your strong-willed child or whatever. Yeah, wow. And, uh, and it's just, there's no promises. Like there's no, those people are hucksters, you know, you can't control a child, you know, that human being is going to make their choices. And I love, the way that that Curly and Tom story just sets that in place, where at the end she's still doubting, you know, like, what did I do? You know, yeah. where did I get this wrong? You know, which is where a lot of us wind up to, you know, there's something we should have done, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's a bright spot on the album for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about something a, a little um, a little more upbeat. <laughs> um, tell me uh, about Granny Briscoe. That is a little more upbeat. That's yes. a, that is a very much a bright spot. Yeah, yeah um, so I noticed there was this point where I had written the... Uh, had written maybe Ab Claiborne and Dead Man's Hollow and the Henry Martin songs. And... Um, I wanted to I wanted to check some of the facts um, in the songs, and I wanted to like look for more material too. And I'd gone to uh, the Newton County Historical Society in Jasper, and there was a woman. Uh, she's passed away since, but Donna Dodson um, was there, and she was just a great person to visit with about all this stuff. And uh, and I had noticed with that collection of what I had so far, song wise, and I think I'd written some of. Some of the Martin family songs, too. Anyway, all the women so far at this point on the album were being abducted or murdered. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and like, I noticed that, and I thought, well, this, there needs to be some kind of balance to this. And I told Donna about that, and she said, I'm glad you're thinking about that. <laughs> I said, well, who are some heroic women that I could write about? And Granny Briscoe was the first one that came to mind for her. Um, I think that, I think that uh, 
Debbie Martin is a heroine too, a kind of a broken one, but like I still admire Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, she was trying so hard, and what more could you ask for? We're gonna we're all gonna make mistakes, but anyway, <laughs> we're talking about Granny Briscoe though. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so um, I started to read about Granny Briscoe, and there's a few a few good stories that are all included in the book. My favorite, I mean, I love the Granny Briscoe story that's in the song, mm -hmm. but I love the one with the peaches. Did you have a chance to read? Where she she was the first person to figure out how to sulfur peaches, which I don't even know for sure what that means, but I think you burn sulfur around the peach tree. Mm -hmm. She was the first person to figure that out in Newton County, and so she had peaches when everybody's peaches were being eaten oh. up by worms, huh. and uh, mm -hmm. and word got out and somebody tried to steal her peaches, mm -hmm. and she shot she shot him. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> with with uh, like buckshot or salt <laughs> in the rear end, and. Uh, and he went up to Harrison and got his got doctored. And the mm -hmm. the doctor, since she was a midwife, the doctor knew her well. And he, he wrote her a letter and told her the next time to aim a little higher because he, <laughs> he didn't want to pick all that out of that fella's rear end. <laughs> 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 but I like that story because she's so, like, she's fierce. Mm -hmm. She's smart. She's, like, she's a scientist, you know. Yeah. She's using science to make her life better. And... And uh, she's not to be trifled with, you know. Mm -hmm. But what she's really known for is, you know, being a midwife and delivering over a thousand babies in her career. Mm -hmm. She started in her 20s and she was on horseback until her early 80s. Um, just at the drop of a hat, she would go uh, mm -hmm. when the family needed her. And, uh, and so she has a dear, you know, she's dear to a lot of families. And there are mm -hmm. people who will still like who know that their grandparent was delivered by her and it's a point of pride for those people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really special to meet her descendants. Yeah. They're really, really proud of her and they just light up mm -hmm. when you talk to them. Now that is, that is actually one story that we had become aware of somehow or another. Yeah, in fact, uh, you had told me about, had I, when, I think it was before when you were even thinking about writing it, you said, have you heard the story about the eye of the needle and Grant? And you, oh, yeah. You, I was just like, I, oh, I want to write this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, you beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's awesome. <laughs> not, I'm not going to mess it's, with yeah. perfection. It, it was so rich. It, it was clear that it had to be a song one way or another. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know that B. Bluff song that's on your uh, Still a River yeah. album? Like when I read that story, I thought like this has got to be, <laughs> this has got to be a song. And I like thought about it and thought about it. And I'm like, Every way I hear this has a much better banjo player than yeah. me on it. <laughs> and then the next time I talk to you guys, you had it. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it. and I irony, we, we read that in Ken Smith's book, The Buffalo River Country. We read uh -huh. the this, this story there. And it, he had said something like, the, the honey just poured down the mountain like 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. But when we played in Ponca, some of the grand, grandsons yeah. or great-grandsons came up and said, that's not what really happened. Mm -hmm. So there again, the, the, the uh -huh. narrator was, the story was different. than, But it didn't, mm -hmm. it, apparently they lowered the honey down and everybody took it away and the boys didn't get any. Mm -hmm. It was trying to get the honey out of that. Mm -hmm. that. Will you tell us a little more about that story for the listeners? Well, they, oh, yeah, 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 just to give you some background. Back so down. Bee Bluff is, a, is a, a place that, that many people know about on the Buffalo. But the story behind it was that some young teenagers in the early 1900s were, had noticed that there was a beehive up on top of the, on the way, bluffs. Way, way up, up on the bluffs, 80 feet up. And they were, you know, at that, that time, honey was a very valuable thing, you know, hard to find, come by. So... They started thinking about lashing together sticks and making a homemade ladder, and they did. <laughs> and they went up there, and it turned out to be a bigger job than they could. They couldn't quite get it done by hand, and so they had to come back down. And they they went and got some dynamite, a small bit of dynamite, <laughs> and they went up there again in the ladder and actually blew a hole right out of the bluff. Oh. And um, the honey, of course, came tumbling down. <laughs> and the, the neighbor by this time, the the entire community had found out about this, and they were all ready to capture the honeys that fell down. There. <laughs> Dirty honey. So I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I just people didn't used to be so picky. <laughs> yeah. You know, the the thing that just gives me just makes me quiver is the th thought of being on a homemade eighty foot ladder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a lot. Of, that's high up there. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You know, it's amazing that they survived the whole yeah. uh -huh. episode. Yeah. I love the like, the redneck logic of the whole story. <laughs> well, if we got some dynamite, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that should do it. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, well, speaking of insane people, uh, tell me about Sam Davis. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Epic. <laughs> yeah, the, so the way that I collected the Sam Davis story, mm. so I, I'm an unreliable narrator. Um, <laughs> and that I, the way that I collected it, I would just ask people mm-hmm. what they knew, like uh, what they'd heard. Yeah. And, and I took what I liked from every version that was given to me. And uh, after it was all like done and recorded, I came across uh, an actual historical paper from a teacher who's a descendant of Sam mm-hmm. <laughs> and who works at Jasper schools. And it's, it's not a story anybody would write a song about, but we're just not going to bother with the historical <laughs> Sam Davis. He's a nuisance and deserves to be forgotten. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the version of the story that I heard was that Sam had come and the, like where he came from was pretty, uh, it varied wildly, you know, mm-hmm. and so Tennessee and Kentucky were the ones I heard most, and I mm-hmm. think I went with Kentucky. Um, anyway, uh, Mississippi is actually probably where he came from, but that didn't, that's, uh, I didn't hear that in time. So, <laughs> uh, but he, he uh, his sister was abducted, the, the story goes, his sister was ad- abducted by Native Americans, and he tracked them from that place, Mississippi or Kentucky or wherever, mm-hmm. all the way to Newton County. And this is like in 1820 when there was just no one in Newton County. There was a handful of people there, but there were not there were not towns, you know. Um, and so he's out there, and he's a young man who, who you know, probably for a hundred days tracked um, this tribe of people that had his sister, and then loses the trail. He's stuck in the middle of nowhere, and. And after, you know, starting off with total confidence is not, it's not worked out, you know. And, uh, yeah, and uh, he uh, kind of loses his mind. And uh, he, I, I, I related to, you know, Sam being a person of faith um, because I've had my own journey with that and my own struggles with that and had to come to terms with reality in some ways, you know, that I think that happened to him as well, disappointment. And when you, when you really believe that you know that God exists and God's going to do something a certain way and it doesn't happen, it's a pretty big, that's pretty jarring, you know? And so really related with that part of the story. And Sam, you know, uh, Sam's stuck in the middle of nowhere. God didn't do what he thought he would do. And he can't find his sister. And he, anyway loses his mind and starts preaching off this bluff and in my in my version of the story he blames the people that are there mm-hmm. um that they won't they they won't tell him where his sister is mm-hmm. and uh and he does that for years and he actually uh every version of the story that i heard he starts a farm which did historically happen he got married he had a child um he actually got wealthy um but he also kept climbing this huge bluff which you've have you ever been to sam's throne i haven't i haven't i was back gonna ask where it was yeah <laughs> it's <a beautiful> place. <laughs> yeah it's near mount judy you kind of uh, you take a right after mount judy on highway 123 if you follow the directions yeah in and the first song <laughs> yeah. of the yeah. album yeah. 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 when you when you get you there you will know you will know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is the last that's the last line of yeah. the song yeah. um <laughs> yeah he, he you know even having a family having a farm he was climbing this bluff to like preach hellfire and damnation <laughs> to all these people. And like the story goes that you could hear him from inside your house, that he was that loud. <laughs> like people yeah. may exaggerate, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely a known thing. He, he just became famous for it. And uh, at some point after years had passed, um, he was hunting and he heard a voice uh, calling for a lost cow in the woods. Um, and followed the voice and it was his sister. And so he was reunited with her and um, she had a family, was a part of a tribe and stayed there. And, uh, and Sam became known for his preaching from the bluff. And also he, he, he had some riches and he claimed that he'd buried gold um, somewhere. Uh, some people say up on the bluff. And he claimed he was going to live a thousand years. And uh, I just love this story. I love that he became kind of larger than life. <laughs> He's a really broken hero. Um, but there's something about, there's something about the, the romantic picture of this guy shouting from up there. Kind of a John Brown kind of picture <laughs> to me. Um, that I don't know. I love Sam. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Mm-hmm.
All right. Um, so did collecting stories about him, is that what led to all the other stories? Or do you think it was just kind of, you just kind of collected them all based on location for this project? Um, I think, yeah, they, it was based on location. And I was asking people if they, what they knew about. And I'd, mm -hmm. often I'd ask people about Sam and they'd say, no, I don't know anything about him, but I know about this. And oh, they'd tell me know. another story. That's right. And that's how, like, Ab Claiborne, mm -hmm. uh, I came across that story. I asked uh, Jerry Claiborne mm -hmm. if he knew anything about Sam Davis because he was from uh, Mount Judy or Deer. Uh, Mount Judy, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, no, but I can tell you a story about my great-grandfather. And he told me the story mm -hmm. of Ab Claiborne. And, mm -hmm. Scary dude. Uh, <laughs> lots of scary yeah. dudes in that family. <laughs> there's a, there, uh, that's, some, that's something that emerges from this, is um, that there's, like, these seriously, like, crazy, scary stories, like murder-suicides, and, and then, you know, just amazing tales of survival, and, like, it's very vivid, like, I could kind of see in my mm. mind, because there's pictures of um, Granny Briscoe in here, and, like, mm -hmm. I kind of, like, see them, like, carrying her in her rocking chair so mm -hmm. she could order people when she mm -hmm. was too old to catch the babies, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, like, there's a, a, incredible tales of survival, on this mm -hmm. one. Um, so, and the artwork is really lovely. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the artwork? Your mother painted the maps. Or the, mm -hmm. um, I meant to ask before we started recording, were those hand painted? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so, okay. I was, um, and then the paper, abstract paper cutouts, can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about what led to you choosing that for to go along with each song? Um, I didn't. I oh, okay. <laughs> so I'd, I had uh, I had a picture in my head of what I wanted, and I uh, Donna had introduced me to her friend Drema, who became a really good friend of mine, and uh, and I thought, and I saw some of her sketches, and I'd seen some of her other artwork, but then when I saw these sketches, I thought, oh, that would that would be great just to have, like the kind of. I just think back to the kind of books I enjoyed as a kid where there's like a line drawing of Tom Sawyer painting a fence, you know? Yeah. And I just thought it'd be nice to have something like that for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked her to do that. And she's like, well, that's not really what I do anymore, but we'll see. And, and I just really thought that that's still where we were headed mm -hmm. when I saw the first <laughs> one that she did. And, uh, and like when somebody's just better than you at something, like you just, you got to trust the process and, mm -hmm. and like, and so Dreama, like I was a little, you know, I was a little confused at first, but like as each of these started coming out, like the aesthetic of it started to really show and it, it's just, it's so much better than what I asked her for. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, the other mm -hmm. one particular I gave her was like the, the size of the page is, it's the shape of the page is gonna be square. And so she started with a square. <laughs> and I don't know if you know where this is headed from having seen this, but if you look at all of her images have something going outside the square <laughs> so that we had to kind of change the layout a little bit to accommodate the <laughs> image going outside of the square. But it's just funny, you like, uh, yeah, creative people, they're going to give them a rule, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> they'll find out why they need to break it. So yeah. it's, it's really an unusual experience to um, to really, when you when you get the CD, it's really fun to sit and look at that picture that Dreama did mm -hmm. and absorb the song while you're looking at the picture. It mm -hmm. becomes, it becomes uh, you know, connected in a way you can't ever unconnect it after that. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful. Yeah. That's uh, a rare thing. I don't, I don't know of any uh, another project that has that quality. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll be, um, still on the hill kind of does that too, though. You 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 you're both known for fusing your music and your art. You know, performing alongside your art. Too. We do. Oh, our, our quilts. We do, yeah. but, but our we haven't never made a we never made yeah. a CD with all the <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, yeah that that much art uh, connection. But yeah, we do have our our what we call our low tech PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> you know. All right, all right. So um, just do y'all have anything coming up that you any performances? plan for this coming up? At the moment, I, I'm going to be playing it, uh, playing some songs from the set uh, in Austin uh, at the end of September and the beginning of October at the uh, Southwest Folk Alliance. Um, right now in our area, I don't have anything on the books. Um, 
yeah. Uh, hopefully that'll be that'll be changing. Yeah, um, well, you were saying you know like people kept coming up to you and telling you like you know actually this happened. So um, mm -hmm. have you had you've had some chances to play these songs? Have mm -hmm. you um, been in Newton County when you you performed? Yeah, them? we uh, we played uh, we played a show we played a couple shows in Jasper, um, and actually I do, I forgot I've got October fourteenth I'm gonna give a talk and play a song at uh, at Mount Judy Heritage. Fest and uh, so they're gonna set up a little booth for me. They're waving the ten dollar booth fee oh, yeah. for me. <laughs> they're really excited that I'm coming, and I, I'm like, "Oh, is there a fee for this?" And she said, "For you, we're just gonna we're not gonna charge you that ten dollars." So I appreciated that. What a deal! Yeah, what a deal. We, we were um, hoping to get to do that with you. But, you know, we yeah. have a we have a show the same weekend. So. Mm. Couldn't do, um, it, couldn't do it. So that is coming up, and I'm looking forward to, you know, some of those folks there are descendants of some yeah. of these people, so it's going to be pretty sweet. There was one thing that happened as I was talking to her. I don't know if I told you guys this, but she she said uh, at some point in the day, they're going to take a tour over to the Davis family graveyard, which is in the middle of a cow field, like surrounded by, there's a, the cow field has a barbed wire fence around it, and then the graveyard has a fence around it, and it's all thicket in the graveyard and, and stuff. But the, uh, I know all this because I, I, I went through the barbed wire and tore my pants oh, trying to oh get yeah. through there okay. and went and looked at all the stones. Mm -hmm. Like Sam Davis has no grave in there, but his wife does, mm -hmm. and several, as several other people in the family do as well. Wow. Um, but anyway, I was telling this, this lady's telling me they're going to have a tour, and I'm like, I know that place. I, I tore my pants on that fence. And she's like, well, then you were trespassing on my land. Oh. I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I hope you can forgive me. And she, yeah, she's good about it. <laughs> and we did get to perform the, the entire uh, CD with her and for two really wonderful, well-attended mm -hmm. shows, and one in Fayetteville and one in Little Rock mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. earlier this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Really, really fun. And, and Don and I are very open to doing more of that. We had a great time. You know. yeah. awesome. I hope we get to do it's that again. It was I so, do too. I, I, the group I that we had is so it's, sweet, too. It's, yeah, we, yeah, exactly. And I, for me, it's, I, I'm playing upright bass, which is something I don't normally do live like this. And, and <laughs> it's really something I, I enjoy. I, do, I play bass mostly in the studio and less, mm -hmm. less. And so this is, I was... Appreciate being asked. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so sweet. All right. Well, tell people where they can find the album. Um, the best place to get it is on my website, uh, AaronSmithSongs.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can order easily through there. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a great place. And it's if you want to just listen, um, you can you can do that. The book, you are missing out on quite a bit without yeah. the book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's up on Spotify and iTunes and all the other YouTube and everywhere else. If you wanted to take a listen to it from there, mm -hmm. it's it's right there. Yeah, yeah. it's a CD package. I just yeah. want to throw it. I mean, you, yeah. it's like no, no other CD it's in gorgeous. your collection. It's a book. <laughs> it's, it's more a book than it is a CD. Mm -hmm. And it's just lovely the way it's laid out. And it's really rich to just start reading. Open it up and just start reading. Mm -hmm. Thanks, mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank y'all so much for joining me today. Yeah. What song are you planning on playing? We're gonna play Granny Briscoe. All right. I can't wait to hear it. Thank you for showing for coming in today. <laughs> thank you so much, Monica. <laughs> yeah. When Granny Briscoe couldn't walk no more, they took her rocking chair with a man on each arm, carried her out to the yard. There were rows of picnic tables out there set up in the shade. People came from distant towns for Granny Briscoe's 88th birthday. When she was young, they called her Lizzie. She had six children of her own. But it wasn't just for Mother in. Granny Briscoe wouldn't be known. No, Lizzie was a midwife, and she'd ride across these lands at the bedside of a mother soon to be. She'd lend a steady hand. 
Oh, she was sighed for weary, frightened eyes through the hollers and the hills. See her coming day and night, riding hard against the clock. For the sake of mother and child, she was kind of help you long to see. Kind of brave you'd want to be. Sometimes the calls came at midnight, the crack of dawn, dinner time. Didn't matter when those calls came in. Lizzie feared no dark of night. They would call to pass the river to the mountains' other side. She'd climb a ladder through a stony cleft, passing through the needle's eye. Lizzie Briscoe knew the way through the darkness to the light. One thousand souls are born with the zebras go as their guide. Oh, she was a sight for weary, frightened eyes through the hollers and the hills. See her coming day and night, riding hard against the clock. For the sake of mother and child, she was kind of help you long to see. Kind of brave you'd want to be. Granny rode into her 80s through Newton County and far beyond when she was thrown from her horse she knew her riding days were done couldn't walk no more I took her rocking chair with a man on each arm carried her out to the yard there were rows of picnic tables out there set up in the shade people came from distant towns for Granny Briscoe's 88th birthday <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>